Hi, good morning. Welcome to Low Live on Sunday the 20th of June. You're very welcome to our online service. Now I'm heading off on holiday next week, uh, traditional time in Northern Ireland for holidays. Maybe you are doing the same. Uh, but we, we hope and pray as a church that you will get some good rest uh, and sunshine over these next number of weeks and months. Well, we're here today to worship the Lord. It's such a wonderful thing to spend time with God. And I would encourage you to open your life, your heart, uh, your mind to the Lord this morning as we worship, as we sing, as we listen to the word of God. And speaking of singing, I'm delighted that Louise, one of our praise leaders, is going to lead us in a song. And then Heather is going to speak to the boys and girls. nice to see you this morning um, and we're in the kitchen today because we're going to try a bit more baking and the last time we baked big I made a mess of it didn't I but this time we're going to go by the recipe aren't we yeah and I thought actually you could try this too it's a really really easy recipe you don't need any scales you don't need a mixer uh, all you need are some quite easy to find things and we're going to show you what you need 
you need some sunflower oil, you need some plain flour, caster sugar, eggs, baking powder, coconut, raspberries and a yogurt. And the other toys are here, they're Mr. Klein and Teddy and they are just watching what we're going to do. Well boys and girls, uh, the toys are watching and Big R is going to help me, yeah? And he's up for baking, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, so what you do is you use the carton as your measuring container. The first thing you do is you put the yogurt into the bowl. I've got a raspberry yogurt, but you can use a natural yogurt or I suppose maybe anything. It doesn't matter that much. So one carton of yogurt in the bowl. Then you use your carton to measure three cartons of flour like that. And you put that in the bowl. And it's one carton of sugar and one tablespoon of baking powder and one carton of oil and three eggs that you beat up a little bit. We didn't trust you with the eggs this time, sure we didn't? No, no. Right, pour all that in and Big R is going to give it a stir. If Big R could do it, boys and girls, you could do it. So we give it a stir, just until you can't see the flour anymore. Nearly finished. Okay, here we go. Yeah! Right, more or less finished. And then we put in half a yoghurt pot of coconut and two yoghurt pots of raspberries. And you just stir them very gently. You don't want to mush them up too much. You just stir it very gently. Okay. And the recipe when I was reading it, when you get it cooked, you can have it with cream as a dessert, cream or ice cream. Or you could just have it like a cake. Uh, but it looks very, very nice. And here we go into the into a tin. If you didn't have a tin this shape, you could do it in a any sort of a tin, I think. You all right there, big R? Yeah, good job. Oops, nearly there. Okay, here we go. Last little bit. And into the oven. And all the instructions are going to be on the uh, website about what you need to do. There you go. Yeah. Now, we're going to be sending the recipe probably to your houses this afternoon. And um, if for any reason you don't get the recipe, just if you email admin at low, Melanie will send you out the recipe. But she's also said she sent it this afternoon to um, the people that she is in regular contact with anyway. So we're going to leave this for about... Uh, Oh, I can't remember. Is it half an hour? 40 minutes? Can't remember. Uh, we'll let you know and we'll see what it's like in a while. Bye! Well, boys and girls, we've taken the cake out of the oven. Here it is here. I actually forgot uh, the, what the recipe said. You need to cook it for about 15 minutes. But you'll see that all on the recipe online. Anyway, Big R and I are dying to see what it's like, aren't we? Yeah! So we're going to cut it up. Here we go. Here we go, the toys are looking on as well. Let's see what it looks like. Let's see. Ooh, how lovely is that? It's great, isn't it? Yeah, it looks lovely. Well, do you know, when I was making this cake, I was thinking, boys and girls, that this cake can tell it, can explain things about God and things from the Bible to us. There's a verse in the Bible, the toys are holding them here, holding it here. You are the body of Christ and each of you is part of it. And Big R is going to drink, draw a ring around the most important word. Each of you is part of it. When we were making the cake, we couldn't have made the cake just with flour. We couldn't have made the cake just with the eggs. That wouldn't have been nice. We needed different ingredients. Also, there were some ingredients we only needed a little bit of. We only needed a little bit of the baking powder. We only needed a little bit of the coconut, but they were very important too. If we hadn't had baking powder, it wouldn't have made the cake all nice and spongy like this. 
So God wants us to realise that we are like the ingredients. We are important. All of us are important. The church just can't be one person. It needs to be all of us. He wants each of us to have a part. And the way that we join the ingredients together to make this amazing cake, God wants us to work together for him to achieve amazing things for him. Now, the competition this week that Big R and I would like you to do is why don't you try making the cake as a family activity? You could decorate it with um, maybe white chocolate and more raspberries, or you could uh, serve it with cream or ice cream and more raspberries. Send us a picture of what you've done. If you don't fancy baking, we'd love you to write out the verse again. You could decorate it whatever way you'd like to do. And if you send your entries to admin at low.church, and we'll be a prize for the best ones. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you very much, uh, Louise and Heather. And boys and girls, I hope you enjoy that competition uh, for this week. Well, I'm going to read from the Word of God. Um, uh, the boys and girls have gone off, or if you'd like to go off, boys and girls, uh, I hope you have a great day and a great Sunday. Uh, well, the rest of us are going to read from Esther chapter 9. This is the last in our Esther, the, Esther, the Mystery Catcher series. Uh, chapter 9, and uh, then next Sunday we move on to something else. But let's listen uh, to a few verses from chapter 9. On the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, the edict commanded by the king was to be carried out. On this day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but now the tables were turned and the Jews got the upper hand over those who hated them. The Jews assembled in their cities and all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those seeking their destruction. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. All the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews, because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces, and he became more and more powerful. And we'll finish our reading there at verse 4 of chapter 9. Well, let's bow before the Lord. Let's pray. I don't know what week you've had, uh, where you are in life. Um, I know it's been very unsettling and, and everything changes almost every week. Um, but we know that the Lord is with us and that's the most important thing. He is our rock in the midst of this pandemic. So uh, shall we pray? Father, thank you, Lord, uh, for being with us today. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you're with us. Thank you that you will never forsake us. And Father, as we live through these unusual days, unusual times, Father, we ask that you may draw near to each one of us especially. We pray, Father, that we may know your closeness. We pray, Lord, that we will not be afraid, that, Lord, we will have enough for each day, that, Lord, we will not cross bridges before we get to them, but that, Lord, we will live each day one day at a time. Thank you for being with us. We thank you, Lord, uh, that you want to speak to us now and we pray that you would help us to open our hearts before you. And we pray for the anointing of your Holy Spirit as we share from your word, the Bible, the word of God. We invite you, Lord, into the midst of us. And we pray in the name of our Saviour, Jesus. Amen. Well, I don't know what kind of week you've had uh, this week. Uh, for me, I, I was out getting some uh, fuel, and uh, you have to do that, uh, to keep the car running, and uh, I find my favourite cinema suite. Now, I have, I'm a cinema goer. We have a little cinema club in, in the church, Mark and I are members, and uh, when we go to the cinema, I have one suite I like to buy, and that is Revels. I just love Revels. And so I was in the garage, I saw these Revels, and I thought, oh, I can't resist. So I got a little, a small bag, not a big one, and uh, I gorged on the Revels. Now, there's a, just a little problem with Revels, and that is there's a really hard toffee, 
which is covered in chocolate, looks like all of the others. And uh, so the, the thing is not to crunch hard on it. And so anyway, I was gorging on these delicious revels, thinking of it, there was a coffee one and it was that hard uh, toffee and, and uh, yep, I lost a filling. And so, oh no, uh, what do you do in a pandemic when you've lost a filling? I thought, well, maybe it'll be all right. So I got up the next morning, the pain started. So I phoned my dentist and, and they're shut. Uh, they're, they're not allowed to do any surgery for, until the 20th of July. Uh, but the person I spoke to kindly said, look, we have these self-use dental packs. Why don't you come and try that out? Went down, got the pack, came home, got my little bit of cement, never done this before, uh, shoved it up into the cavity, got a little, there's this little stick thing, put it up there as well, press it, compress it, uh, left it for two to three hours and uh, well, it, it's holding okay. I never thought in my lifetime I'd become my own dentist, but that has been the week that I've had. Now you may be asking yourself, well, who cares? Why are you telling us this? And I might reply, well, why does anything matter? Why is there any significance about anything that you or I do? We might even say, well, is life itself significant? You know, it's very difficult to argue that, that life has an ultimate significance or meaning unless you believe in God, unless there's some objective truth or, or divinity, life really is insignificant. But I want to share with you today that, that life, you don't need to panic, life is significant and your life is significant. In fact, one of the great um, gifts that God has given to Western culture uh, through Jesus Christ is this resolute belief that every person and every life matters. And that was from, that was given to our culture from Christianity because we believe that everyone is made in the image of God. Every life is valuable, precious, and equal in the eyes of God. And that is something that we have given uh, to the rest of our culture. Now, what I want to share with you today is the significance of your life. Your life is so significant that God works in mysterious ways to bless you and to look after you. And what I want to share, this is the, the last episode in Esther, the Mystery Catcher, uh, episode nine. What I'd like to share with you today is how to learn uh, the mysterious ways of God. Learn the mysterious ways ways of God. So let's look into the Bible. Let's look into this uh, for a few minutes this morning. And the first thing I want to share with you is that learn that sometimes to step into God's plan for your life, you need a God moment. To step into the plans, God's plans for your life, sometimes you need a God moment. Uh, I want to summarize a little bit of the story this morning. You know, we've covered uh, the, the book up to this point. Remember Haman, he was the, the villain, the guy who planned the destruction of the Jews. And, and what he did was he got these kind of like what we would call die or dice, uh, called pur, P-U-R. They were marked stones. And what he did, he, he rolled these stones. And, and what he was trying to do was he was trying to work out the best time, the best day to choose to annihilate the Jews. And that's because Haman believed in something called fate uh, or determinism. That, you know, your life is set by fate and determinism. And you can't really change. You can't really beat fate. Uh, whatever is going to be is going to be. And that's the direction. And if you're in that direction, nothing's going to change it. And so what he did was he rolled his die or purr and um, hoping that fate would agree with his plans. You know, that, that it was fate that the Jews were going to be destroyed. That, that, was, that was Haman. I don't know if you, you believe in fate. I don't know if you believe in determinism. You, you know what luck is? Uh, luck is the hope that fate is on your side. Now, that's all that luck is. Uh, Jesus didn't believe in fate and Jesus didn't believe in luck. Jesus believed in something completely different. Jesus believed there's a loving Heavenly Father in heaven and the Heavenly Father's desire for each of our lives is actually to interrupt the direction our lives are going in, to take us from a wrong direction to a right direction, to take us from uh, a, a thing or, or, or a perspective that's going to damage us into the best possible life that you or I could have. And one of the things that Jesus believed was that each one of us, for each one of us, God has a plan for our lives. I wonder if you've ever thought about that. God has a plan for your life. Life has choices. We have free will. We can choose how we live. Rather than our lives being determined, God is a God who wants to intervene, to show us a better way, to change, if necessary, the direction that our lives are going in. 
and sometimes to step into God's plan for my life, for your life. We need what's called a God moment. Have you ever had a God moment? Esther in chapter 4, if we roll back. In Esther chapter 4, Esther has a God moment. And it's really clarified for her by, uh, through her adoptive father. And uh, this is uh, what we read in chapter 4, verse 14. And uh, her father says to her, And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. For such a time as this. This is a God moment. This is a moment for Esther. That God has brought a clarity to her life. And God is saying to her, Esther, I have a plan for you. And that plan is right now. And what you need to do is step into the plan. Uh, and we have read the story and we know that she does and, and uh, we're, we're grateful that she does uh, because she, she changes a lot of things. Sometimes to step into God's plan for your life, you need a God moment. I wonder if you've had a God moment. I wonder if you've stepped into God's plan. Do you even know what God's plan is for your life? It's such a wonderful journey to discover what God's plan is for my life. Well, one of the things that God does, uh, just like with Esther and Mordecai, one of the things God does is God sometimes sends another person uh, to our lives who speaks to, into our lives and, if you like, reveals to us the God moment. Uh, this was brought home to me recently. I was reading a book by Jim Simbala uh, from Brooklyn Tabernacle Church in New York. Um, wonderful, wonderful church and a great uh, preacher and pastor. And he tells the story of a guy called Fernie. Uh, or Fernando. And uh, Fernie or Fernando uh, was a guy brought up in New York, got into drugs at an early age, and, and his uh, crime, his life of crime, just got spiraling out of control. Eventually, he got into the guns, the, the drug gangs. Eventually, he hooked up with a former uh, criminal, and they went and they kidnapped someone, and they got the ransom money. And then they went wild, and they went into all these bars and talked big about what they had done. And of course, the police got wind of it. And of course, they got arrested. And Fernie got 25 years in prison. 25 years. So he's in prison. And his wee old mum, who's in her 70s at this point, his mum comes to visit him in prison. And she just, she starts to weep. And she says to him, you know, son, I'm not going to live to see the day when you're set free. Uh, and Fernie that night was heartbroken. Uh, he, he, he went to his cell and apparently he, he knelt down. He hadn't prayed in years. He knelt down before God and he said, Lord, if you get me out of here, I'm going to give you the rest of my life. A year went by. One night at two in the morning, there's a knock on his cell door. The, the guard says to him, uh, Fernie, the parole board has met and you are now free to go home. Wow, he gets his clothes back, he gets some money, he jumps in the bus, he goes down to the town where he was from, he gets off in the morning the, into the bus terminal, and there's a guy from his former life, a drug dealer, he hooks up with him and he, he does drugs for three days, goes in a binge for three days. He starts to spiral out of control. People would say, there's, there's nothing that's going to change a guy like Fernie. His life is just going back into the same direction. He starts to do petty crime, starts to steal stuff to, to pay for the drugs, one day he's being chased by the police and he runs and he finds this crowd. There's a crowd sitting doing some kind of an open air thing. And he runs and he sits down in between these two people in this crowd and he blends in and the police run by and he gets away and goes, phew, missed the police. And they turn out to be Christians. And one of the, the guys in this, this group of Christians who've been doing some out, out street uh, worship or outdoor ministry, one of the guys is called Louis and he comes up to Fernie and says, you know, God wants to remind you of the prayer that you prayed in your prison cell. And Fernie was gobsmacked. He said it was like listening and hearing God speak. He got down on his knees and he wept before God. He confessed his sins, asked for forgiveness. That God moment changed his life. He stepped into God's plan. Today he's an evangelist, today he speaks in churches. And, and, and the great thing is how God has changed the direction of his life. Many people would have written Fernie off and thought, that guy will never change. God, in love and mercy, stepped down into his life, gave him a God moment and changed the direction of his life. You see, sometimes we need a God moment before we can step into God's plan. I often think that a God moment is like a label on a present. Uh, you ever get a present, oh, under a tree or something, oh, that, that's for me, you see the label. The God moment's like the label. 
so that you will then open the gift, the gift of God's plan for your life. Do you know God's plan for your life? Would you like to step into um, his plans for you? Ask him for a God moment. Ask him today to show you the plans that he has for you. Maybe you're a believer. Maybe you know what God's plans have been for you, but it's been a while. You know, like an app or something, it's been a while since you've downloaded the next bit. Uh, and perhaps today you need to come to the Lord and say, Lord, uh, could you show me more of the plan that you have for my life? So that's the first thing um, uh, in terms of learning God's mysterious ways. Sometimes to step into his plan for your life, you need a God moment. Secondly, learn the great reversal. Learn about the great reversal. Uh, God is the God of great reversals. And uh, I, I love this story of Esther because it's about a, a huge reversal. Let's turn to the story then uh, in chapter 9. And this is the account of what happens. It's written kind of like an historical record, uh, more than a narrative um, or, or a novel at this point. But let's just read together. The Jews assembled in the cities in all the provinces of King Xerxes to attack those determined to destroy them. No one could stand against them because the people of all the other nationalities were afraid of them. And all the nobles of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and the king's administrators helped the Jews because fear of Mordecai had seized them. Mordecai was prominent in the palace. His reputation spread throughout the provinces and he became more and more powerful. So discover the mystery of the great reversal. He became more and more powerful. You know, this story uh, by chapter three was, was heading in one direction. The direction was the, the destruction of the Jewish people. But God brought about a great reversal. And, you know, one of the mysteries of this world is what God is doing in it. And, and what God is doing today in the world is bringing about a great reversal. You know, sin came into the world, destroyed the world, destroyed creation. Before that, the world was pointed in a certain direction that was towards God's goodness. After sin came into the world, the world changed direction. It changed its axis. It's now pointed towards destruction and a spiral into evil and sin and all of that stuff. And what God is working towards today is the reversal of the direction of the entire world. What an incredible, what an incredible truth. You know, they, the, the Jewish people today celebrate the story of Esther in a feast called the Feast of Purim, named after the Pur that, that Haman had cast. And it's a, it's a play on words, really. And in this feast, they celebrate the great reversal. They celebrate the power of God to reverse things, to reverse decisions, to change directions in people's lives. Uh, one of the things that they do for this festival, and, and they still do it today, is they dra dress up in outlandish clothes. Uh, apparently, they actually eat um, these little uh, cakes or, or pastries made in triangular shapes. And, and they were meant, they're meant to represent Haman's uh, wealthy pockets. Um, anyway, it's just part of the culture. Um, but one of the other things that they do is they wear these clothes. And sometimes they wear uh, reversible clothes. Have you ever had a, a reversible jacket? You know, it's blue on the outside. You take it off, you pull out the arms, you put it back on, it's brown. They wear reversible clothes. And the reason why they wear reversible clothes is to remind them that God is the God who brings about reverses. He can reverse things. He can change directions. He can interrupt the flow and the, what seems to be the plan of your life and show you something else. The celebration of the great reversal. You know, the greatest thing God has done in the world to reverse the direction back to his goodness was when Jesus Christ died on the cross. Uh, the, the church father, Irenaeus, who lived in the second and third century, uh, down in, in France, in Lyon in France, uh, he had a wonderful way of understanding the power and the effect of Jesus' death on the cross. He said that when Jesus died on the cross, he, he began what we might call a chain reaction. The power of his life was greater than any sin, uh, greater than the power of evil. So he not only broke the power of evil, but the power of Jesus' life given out of pure love on the cross for you and me, uh, was such that it would that his his life from that moment on began to work outwards and started to undo every sin, 
every act of evil to bring about the greatest reversal, literally, of all time. That God will one day totally reverse all evil, all sin, all disaster, anything you can think of. So that the world will be healed and enjoy the goodness that God had intended for it from the very beginning. Isn't that a powerful idea, a powerful way to understand what Jesus Christ has done? You know, Jesus came into the world. Your life is so significant that you are part of the great reversal. Jesus came into the world to reverse the sins and the wrongs in your life and in mine. And when we come to him and ask him for that forgiveness, he kind of reverses it all as if it had never happened. And it's an amazing thing. He wants to reverse your sins. He wants to heal your shame. He wants to heal your brokenness. He wants to restore you so that you will know the goodness of God in your life. So my advice, put your faith in him. Tie your life to him. Step into the plans that he has for you. Learn the mystery of the great reversal. What is God up to in the world today? God is bringing about a great reversal. You know, you could be listening to this talk this morning and, and I get it. You could be sitting and you could be thinking, you know, I really need a reversal in my life right now. Uh, my family, my kids, uh, I've lost my job. I really need a great reversal. Well, can I just encourage you, ask God for that reversal. Ask him for it right now. Just start to pray. Uh, remind God. Uh, one of the things that the Bible says is to remind God of things. It's not that he forgets. He, it's rather he just wants us to ask. Remind God of the, of the promises that he has a plan for your life. Remind him uh, of your circumstances, the needs that you have, the challenges. Uh, maybe you're short of cash. Maybe you're worried about your future. Maybe you're worried about someone's health. Let's stand together and let's pray together for a great reversal. We believe in hope. We believe God can do more than we could ever imagine. The Lord is calling us today to step out, to not believe in fate or determinism, to not believe in luck, but to step out of those things and believe in him and to live under the banner and flag of what we might call what's possible. Because God is the God who asks the question, what's possible in this circumstance? Learn the mystery of the great reversal. And the final thing I'd like to share with you uh, this morning is learn the joy of being a mystery catcher. Learn the joy of being a mystery catcher. You know, it's an amazing idea Amazing truth that God has a plan for everyone's life. Sometimes people go into department stores and they have a personal shopper. I myself have never gone to a personal shopper. Um, I would find a, a very embarrassing experience. Um, but anyway, other people are more confident than I am and maybe more uh, outgoing than me. And, and bless you if you've done it. But, but people go for a, a personal shopper and the, the people pull the clothes down and they work out what suits you and things like that. Um, but, but this is something completely beyond anything like a bespoke service. The God of the cosmos has designed a plan that fits you and you alone. And, and when we step into that plan, maybe through a God moment, as we trust in Jesus and step into that plan, it is a revolutionary experience. Let's look um, at a final reading today. Um, in uh, Esther, uh, it says this uh, in verse 21 of chapter 9. That they should celebrate annually. This is the setting up of the Feast of Purim. That they should celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. As a time when the Jews got relief from their enemies. And as the month when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration. He wrote to them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. It's not a, a lovely description. When, whenever we encounter God, uh, we really become a mystery catcher. I've used that phrase throughout the series. A mystery catcher, what does that mean? It means that, that suddenly you've caught, 
You, you've caught the presence of God. You now know that there is a God and you've got to know him. You've encountered the mystery and the mysterious presence of God in the world today. You've caught the mystery. You've caught the great reversal. You know what God is doing in the world and how God is working. And you've caught the mystery that God has a plan for your life and you've stepped into that plan. He also has a plan for the world. And here's the thing. Whenever you catch the mystery of who God is and what he's up to in the world, you start to see life differently. You start to see people differently. And that, that's what Mordecai is alluding to. Mordecai says, give people that you know gifts of food when you're celebrating the Feast of Purim. In other words, be kind to each other. Look at someone the way God looks at them. See them as God sees them. And that's the great part, one of the great ethics of Christianity, to, to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, or to love each other as Jesus has taught us in John's Gospel. But then he goes on to say, not only do, do you uh, look after each other and uh, see each other as God sees them, uh, each other, but then care for people that no one else sees. And he says, give gifts to the poor. Often poor people are people whom other people don't see, notice, or bother about. But here, Mordecai is saying, if you have encountered God, if you have caught the mystery, then you're going to see the poor and you're going to be generous towards them. Maybe that's a challenge to us all this morning uh, as we live our lives. Uh, how can we be more generous? Because I believe that if you're a Christian, you should be a generous hearted person. In fact, the church should be the most generous place on the earth, the most forgiving and graceful place on the planet, the place where Jesus reigns in a unique way. So maybe there's a challenge for you today. Are you generous? Are you generous hearted? Uh, that's a good question to ask. And it ties in with this final thing I want to share with you today. Did you notice uh, how Mordecai describes this experience? He turned our sorrow into joy. Uh, the sorrow of sin, the sorrow uh, that comes from, from a life that's going in a certain direction, usually often a self centered or orientated direction and so often we can be our own worst enemies the sorrow of that to the joy of, of having our sins forgiven and stepping into God's plan and knowing the purpose and how I fit in to God's great plan of the great reversal he says it's a joy the joy of knowing God the joy of having God in your life do you have joy in your life today. As if you're a Christian, do you have joy? I want to encourage you this morning. If you don't have joy, do everything you can to get it. We can become so cluttered as we go through life. Uh, if you're a Christian, so easy to clutter your heart with all kinds of stuff. It's so easy to spend our lives gathering and amassing stuff at the expense of joy. One of the things that's come out of this pandemic is a reprioritization. People have said that because they're at the shutdown, they're not able to do the things they normally do, that they kind of have started to reprioritize. And I would encourage you in that. We need to reprioritize. What is God's plan for my life? How is my relationship with God going? And am I enjoying it? Am I enjoying the journey? Do I have joy in my heart? If you're not a Christian, I would encourage you also uh, to put your trust in Jesus and allow him to take away or to turn your sorrow into joy, your mourning into dancing. This is what God does for us in our lives. He changes things. Don't believe in fate. Don't believe in luck. Certainly don't believe in determinism. Believe in a God who says, what's possible? Question mark. A God who can change our directions, who can make such a difference in our lives, who wants to make a difference in your life today. Will you trust him? Will you put your faith in him? I want us to pray today for joy. I want us to pray for joy in our hearts because Jesus is alive and Jesus is with us. It's a wonderful thing to have him as your friend. Can we pray together as we wrap up this series? Let's do that. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you that you're with us. Thank you that you have a plan for our lives. Thank you that you have a plan for this world, Lord. 
Uh, we, we know the world is, is suffering today, Father, but we believe you have a plan. And we pray, Father, that you will uh, continue to bring this world, changing its direction back towards your ultimate goodness. And we thank you that Jesus Christ, dying on the cross, started a chain reaction across time and history. Lord, the reversal, the undoing, the ending, Lord, of sin and evil, destruction, uh, and so many other things, Lord, until that day when the world will be healed and that, Lord, we will have complete goodness reigning over our lives. So, Lord, may we see our lives in, as part of that great reversal. And today, Father, I want to pray, Lord, that we may know uh, joy in our hearts. We pray, Father, that we may know that you are with us. And pray, Father, that we may know the plans that you have for us. Maybe for someone this morning, it's been a while since we thought about God having plans for my life. Maybe we've been drifting. Lord, today we resolve together to step into your plans, to seek what they are. We, we would ask you for a God moment in this next week so that we can know, Lord, where you want us to go, what you want us to do. Come, Holy Spirit, and guide us, Lord. Pray for anyone who would like to put their faith in Jesus for the first time today. Lord Jesus, you love us. You died for us. You want to forgive us all of our sins. And so, uh, Lord, we come to you now and we confess that we have sinned. We confess that we have sorrow in our lives uh, because of various directions that we've gone into, uh, wrong directions. We ask you to forgive us our sins, come into our lives and have a relationship with us, and Lord, guide us in a new direction. Maybe that's the thing that you desperately need today, a new direction. Or, or maybe there's someone else listening this morning. And you need a great reversal. Your circumstances need a reversal. Well, let's ask God together. Lord, we pray together for a person or a situation or a family member or, Lord, whatever it is. And we ask you today for a great reversal. Please come, Lord, and please help us. And so, Father, we pray for our world. We pray for our medics in the front line and all the other front line workers. We ask you today for a vaccination as soon as possible. Lord, we, we desperately need a vaccination. And so we pray for that today, Lord. We pray for wisdom as the uh, restrictions are loosened. We pray that people would be wise in social distancing. Lord, have your hand upon our country and, and the world and help everybody help all nations and all governments we remember the sick before you Lord those here in hospital those who are suffering we pray for your healing Father we commit our lives to you again and we ask that we may know joy in these hearts, that you may turn our sorrow into joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm delighted that Roger is going to lead us in this fantastic song. Play. 
splendor outshines the sun. What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy forever. What other glory consumes like fire? What other power can raise the dead? What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy God. Come and be could rescue me from my failings? Who else would offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him father? Only a holy God, only my holy Well, thank you very much, Roger, for leading us in that lovely uh, song. And thank you to Louise, uh, to Heather, um, for your contribution today. We really appreciate it. And I hope you've enjoyed the service. I hope you feel blessed. I hope you'll go off into the rest of today. And if you're going on holiday, into the rest of your holidays. And, and we trust the Lord will bless you uh, in these next coming weeks. Uh, and uh, we're all hoping for good weather as well. Now, uh, tonight we meet in our Low Live Lounge. Uh, this is an opportunity to ask questions about what we've talked about today, but also to go deeper with God um, in, in a led way. I, I'll be leading that myself. So 7 to 7.45, uh, the room opens at 6.45. You can get the details from mel, admin at low.church, and you're welcome to join us in our service this evening. Uh, on Tuesday night, our prayer gathering continues. And again, you can get the Zoom details from Mel and all of the other Zooms uh, for youth, for children, uh, our contact groups, the Alpha course, everything else is continuing as normal. So uh, there's no reason why you, you shouldn't be connected. We really want you to connect with us through this pandemic. So if you haven't been along, if you haven't connected yet, please come and join us uh, in one of these occasions. And it'd be great to see you, uh, even if we can't see you physically, even on the screen. It would just be great to see you. Uh, so please take up uh, these opportunities to meet together as a family and a church of God's people. Well, uh, I'm going to head off uh, and the Lord bless you. Have a really great Sunday.